Hello, and welcome to another episode of Brave the Fire. Unless you're a fire service professional, chances are when you walk into the local mall or your favorite restaurant, you're not thinking about the fire safety of the building or whether you have the proper exiting opportunities in case of an emergency. Chances are you never gave a second thought to what the interior finish is on the walls at your most happening night spot in town, or if a newly constructed luxury apartment was built to the most current code. These things may not be on your mind on a daily basis, but for a small elite team of the Fayetteville Fire Emergency Management Department, it's a daily concern. Their primary job is to first of all make sure that all newly constructed buildings within the city limits are built to the minimum standard allowed by the North Carolina Fire Prevention Code. They also make sure it stays in compliance with that code at the time it was built for the life of the structure. With over 10,000 inspectable occupancies in Fayetteville, this is a constant and daily task. Today, we'll look at a typical fire inspection and see directly how fire inspectors quietly ensure your safety behind the scenes so that you can enjoy the expectation of safety we all enjoy in public spaces in our city. Occasionally, despite our best efforts at education and preventative inspections, there are fires, sometimes bad ones. Some are accidental, some are intentionally set. Later in the show, we will talk to the men and women whose job it is to figure out how fires start when the cause and origin is unclear, or if it was suspected to have been intentionally set. Because these types of fires often require the assistance of law enforcement, a partnership has been formed between the fire and police departments, as well as the State Bureau of Investigation, known as the Fire Investigation Team, or FIT. Collectively, they determine the causes of the fire and determine how to potentially prosecute fire setters. So, sit back a moment and be prepared to be informed so that you too can help us brave the fire. What we look for when we come into a commercial motel, hotel, as we do these on an annual uh, inspection basis, what we look for is all the life safety features of the building, uh, sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems. Um, we look at all your exits your, um, so that people could get out of the building if they had to in case of an emergency. Uh, we look at your fire alarm system, uh, fire extinguishers, um, smoke detectors, um, anything that has to do with life safety. Hello. Hello, my name is Richard McGee, Assistant Fire Marshal, City of Fayetteville. I'm here to do your annual fire inspection. Okay. Um, would today be a good day to do it? Absolutely. Could you walk with me through your facility? Sure. Where would you like to begin? I would like to go outside and begin outside and then um, work our way in. Okay. Mr. Patel, what I do when I'm working out here is I look for fire department access. Okay. Um, if we did have a fire at this building, would I be able to get uh, fire apparatus um, to the building? Yes. I look for your address numbers, make sure that they're posted. Um, and everything looks fine as far as your access. And I look for your hydrants, your fire hydrants, and they're unobstructed and everything looks good. All right. And I do see that it's been serviced recently and everything is fine. Your pressure gauge is good. Your spare heads are good. Your wrench is good. I see your FTC sign is warm, but it's all right. We can still identify it. I look at all your exit door, make sure your handles are, are all working. Um, your locking arrangements are correct. Uh, your fire alarm panel is in normal mode. That's good. I will need to see at the end of the inspection uh, your inspection reports for your sprinkler system and your fire alarm system. Okay. Okay. Um, can we do? I look for all electrical hazards. I look for um, obstructions of any kind in any of your exits. OK. 
Okay. Do, 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 do. Can we go up to the fourth floor and work our way down? All right, Mr. Patel, uh, I know some of these rooms are occupied. I'm not going to go in any occupied rooms, but what I would like to look at is some vacant rooms. And there's two different kinds of rooms I want to look at. Um, I want to look at a regular room, and I want, I'd like to look at a handicapped room if possible. Okay. And I, and I also would like to look at any um, storage spaces that you have, laundry rooms such as that. Do you want to look okay. at storage? Yep. Don't mind the junk. And you're fine. Could you, here, get up there and I'll push the button for me, please. All right, thank you. I'm gonna see a handicap yes, please. Okay, the difference between a regular room and a handicap room is a handicap room has a combination detector, smoke detector that also flashes. Um, if something happens in here, um, a regular room would just have a regular smoke detector would beep. The hearing impaired could not hear that. When this flashes, it would wake them up and let them know that they have a problem in this room. They also have a fire alarm system in here that would flash, but that would have to set the whole alarm off. This works for just the room itself, okay? So we do make sure that that works. The reason we test the smoke detectors in a room is that's your first line of, super, uh, of uh, alarm. Um, and they usually send a trouble to the fire alarm system, uh, individual rooms. If somebody's in there using a microwave and it smokes it up, it'll set the smoke detector off and it'll let the front desk know that you've got something going on in that room. It will not set the fire alarm system off. However, if you open the door and the smoke gets into the hallway, it will set the complete fire alarm system off for the whole building. So we check all the smoke detectors in every room. And we also look at records that the owners uh, keep of the uh, hotel, and they're supposed to check them um, quarterly. Uh, it's in a maintenance man, but we, we check um, all the smoke detectors. We check, make sure that when you come down the stairwell, you can be able to um, get out of the stairwell. Um, and there's, uh, if you have panic hardware on your, we can't have any other locking arrangements. If, if the uh, general public sees panic hardware, they're going to push that bar. They're going to expect that door to open. So we look to make sure uh, secondary locking arrangements haven't been put on it, that when you push the panic bar, the door still wouldn't open. And that's what we look at Just for the safety of the door. If you hit the panic bar door, you expect it to open. You expect to be able to get out. And then we look at the landing on the other side of the door to make sure it's clear and unobstructed. You should know, and in the hotels, uh, they post on the doors, on the inside of the doors, your ways out and your exit and your routes of um, exiting. Um, what you should do is when you get into an uh, unfamiliar place, you should look around and see where your exits are, see where your stairwells are at, because in case of a fire, you're not going to go back to the elevator. You're going to use the stairs, because the elevator, if the alarm goes off, the elevator is going to come down to the lowest, safest floor and stop right there, and it's, gonna, it's not going to come back up. So you need to know where your stairwells are. You need to know that you can get out of that building safely. And when you go into a restaurant or public space, any public buildings, um, look for your exits. A lot of times, um, people put chairs in front of doors, um, high chairs, for instance, and you know the kids get done using they put, they they obstruct the exits. Make sure the exits are unobstructed. That's the worst um, where we've had deaths 
is, uh, is obstructed access where people couldn't get out. If you're a business owner, you could go online. Um, the Office of the State Fire Marshal has a website. Uh, the fire code is online. You could pull it up and you could look. Um, what we look at, we, we do hotels annually. We do businesses every three years. Um, the best advice I could tell you is you're required to have fire extinguisher service annually, okay? Um, keep your exits unobstructed. And if you have any questions, you can call our office at 910-433-1730. And any fire uh, marshal or inspector would be glad to answer your questions. And that's what we're here for. And then when we come out to do an inspection, we don't want to just be an inspector. We want to have a working relationship with the business and help them continue to grow. We've had a lot of fires uh, in the Fayetteville area uh, in commercial structures and, and a lot of it's, um, we look for security of buildings. We look to make sure, uh, spring is coming on now, but during the winter months, homeless people look for some place to be warm and getting out of the weather. And when we go out and we do inspections, we make sure that these buildings are secured and the, um, keep the homeless people from getting in there and trying to start a fire and stay warm. But we've had a lot of incidences where Homeless people have gone in there and they're just trying to stay warm and they've caused damage to structures. We have a, a whole team now that's been put together through the um, fire department to come in and investigate. It starts out that um, the captains on the engine companies or the, the um, officer on the first end um, engine companies, or it can be a combination of the guys that are on the scene. They all try and work together to come up with an idea of how the fire started. And if they get to where they have questions or um, they're not exactly sure, it's not just your ordinary cooking fire or um, a dryer fire, just something cut and dry, then they call in the fit team and then we come together with them and take the information they gathered. We talk to and interview all the first arriving guys and try and figure out, you know, what direction we need to go. And then if we can pinpoint that, it, that it's a suspicious act, then we take the steps further to, to call in the rest of the guys, whether it's the SBI, the police department, forensics tech, whoever we need to call in. The first thing we'd do is we'd um, walk all the way around the house completely and just see what what's there and that, that's when we pick up whether there was power on the house, gas, that type of thing. And then with the amount of fire that was here, you would start from um, a certain point. Um, each team, you know, might do it a different way. But um, our particular team, we start at the front and then we would walk inside and we'd go from each individual room and go to the part of the um, house where there was the most damage, which usually indicates where your point of origin is, and then we have what's called um, V patterns. There's different patterns that you can look for that's usually on the um, wall, and then you can look for patterns on the floor that could point in a direction if, if uh, um, flammable liquid was poured or something like that. And I mean, like on this particular house here, you know, there was no power on it um, when, they, when they did their walk around and then they went inside you could tell that there was no furniture no clothing um, then it had the places that it pointed towards the homeless living here like um, food and beer bottles and arson is um, where fires intentionally set um, somebody using a flammable liquid or um, and, and strike a match or um, an accidental fire would point towards um, it could be electrical wiring or um, once you get to interviewing people, like if the house would be occupied, you know, it could be a, a kid playing with a match or a lighter. It could have been like a candle knocked over. It just goes by what you interview, what you see, and um, talking to different people is what you come up with, whether it would be an intentionally set fire or an accidental fire. Once we all come up with a consensus of what we think has taken place, and it's pointing in the direction of arson, which is a criminal act, then we, we have the option of calling um, in the SBI, which would be um, Special Agent Lee Newcomb for our area. He would come in and um, help us investigate. We would call the um, 
police department in, they would send out investigators that would take the action on the criminal side, and then we call in the forensics tech. They would come in and help gather um, evidence that points to the criminal side. They would help us gather pictures um, for going to court and um, evidence, and then we also would bring in um, the police officers, whether it's the detective or um, Agent Newcomb from the SBI, and they'll help us interview people further to um, gather statements to make sure we have all of our legal um, documentation where it needs to be if it was to go to court. We want to be good at our job and, and to be able to serve the citizens, you know, and, and they want answers and we want to be able to give them answers, but we don't want to give them a false sense of security of, you know, that we're just telling them something, trying to blow them off. We want to be able to, to show them and actually be able to show them what happened, what the theory is that's there, and, you know, um, not just be working off of a hypothetical guess. When we would start our investigation with um, my team in particular, we would start in, in these couple of rooms here and work our way around because we can tell that, that the heaviest fire damage is back to this area. And after we would have talked to our, um, the, the initial arriving crews, they would have told us, you know, that where their heaviest fire was and we would have already done a 360 all the way around the, the house to be able to see that, that most of the fire and majority of the fire was on that end. But we would just come through here and look just to see if, if possibly there could have been um, any kind of poor patterns or um, any evidence or anything that could point towards the, um, the cause and origin of the fire. And um, we'd work our way around the, um, the most unburned portions first. And like we could tell in this room here, that it, there was a lot of um, smoke and heat damage in this end here. Um, we'd be able to look up and just see that they pulled ceiling just to make sure that the fire hadn't extended here and make sure that they had, they, um, they had it out here. When we're walking through, we would be looking for things like um, the panel box um, to be able to check breakers, see if the, the, any of them had tripped, um, look and see if there could have been anything left behind if it, if it does turn out to be in as, um, an act of arson. Um, looking at the f fixtures, um, the fixtures pull, pull towards the heat, um, especially if you see, like, if they have like ceiling fans or um, light bulbs you can tell where the heaviest heat was because everything will be drooped or pulled towards the fire area. And this gives us a sense of when it was, um, how long it had been since it had been occupied or if it was occupied. Um, like some of the stuff you saw in the other room in there, it, it pretty much just let us know that, that it was probably homeless in here trying to keep warm out of the weather, um, just having some kind of shelter. So then when we move back, when we would come through this room, you can see where the um, paint is actually peeling off of the walls. We were talking, and I was talking earlier about the different kind of patterns where we, we kind of look for a V pattern. You can, pre, you can see how a V pattern, how it goes from the paint missing in the sheetrock has changed here to the bottom where you can actually see where the paint is. So you know, we can tell that most of the heat and it was up high, and it, it, the V patterns point down into it. What it is is a V shape, and it actually goes, I mean, you can have an inverted V or a regular V pattern, but it pretty much points to the, um, the origin of the fire. It, it goes into it. And we can see how the fire was, it was up high because the couch isn't burned. And like, if they came in, if the, guys that responded if for some reason they took all this stuff out we would try and put it back in the same exact place where it was and a lot of times like in this fire we could probably move that chair over there and it would have the marks on the floor of where the chair was sitting so we can tell exactly how it goes and set it back but it gives us a picture of what we're looking at and then when we come in here you can pretty much tell that this is the going to be the room of origin um, it's got what they call alligator and you can see here on the on the, the door here it's different the way that the um, it's burnt 
and how long it's burnt, how deep it is with your charring in the wood. They have pulled a lot of it down, I guess, when they were doing um, their overhaul. And of course, some of it's on the floor here. And then one thing that we would look at too, from a standpoint is um, on the, uh, looking here where the, the window is, there's glass on the inside. So that pretty much tells us that the window was broke from the outside in instead of the inside out. But if we thought that there was an accelerant, we would take and dig all this out. We would throw it out. We'd probably dig out this whole room and just see if there's a pattern on the floor. And if there is, then you know we would get the ID techs to come in and we would cut our samples out, put our markers there, take our pictures, and um, get them to collect evidence and put it in the chain of custody. As a forensic tech, I get called out to a, a lot of scenes uh, to work them um, as they're required. I work at the discretion of the detectives or the battalion fire chief that's on scene. And what that entails, once they find something suspicious, uh, I will go ahead and I have to start out with general photography of the whole residence, like the one behind you. I'll do 360s all the way around. Then the detectives or one of the, the fire folks will say, hey, I believe it came in through this window. So we'll focus on that and then we'll work in and see if there's any type of patterns where a fluid, unknown fluid might have been thrown on the carpeting. If that's the case, then they'll have me collect a known sample, which would be on the opposite side of the, the room, and then where the suspected fluid landed on the carpet or the flooring. And we'll cut that out, and then we'll send both, after we package them, we'll send them both up to the SBI for analysis. Uh, what I've got here is, depending on what type of uh, item that I'm collecting for evidence, it can fit into an, an arson bag where we automatically start the chain of custody because anything collected is considered evidence. So you've got to maintain that through the whole process. Uh, we've got our small uh, cans that we use for flammable materials. We'll seal that up on scene. Uh, in the past, I've collected lighters, uh, lighter fluid cans, items like that, burnt paper, and those will all be sealed up and they'll be sent up to the SBI. Uh, safety being paramount, as the, the forensic tech called into a scene, once they've cleared it to be safe to go inside, uh, we're required to wear some coveralls, we've got some fire boots, uh, safety goggles, uh, the gloves, a mask depending on how bad the odors are and stuff, and then of course a hard hat because stuff is usually falling down from the ceilings. And uh, there might be some alcohol bottles off to the side, a lot of homeless will get into these vacant residents. Uh, we'll go ahead and we can process those for fingerprints, uh, DNA if it's involved, if there's a homicide involved in there. Anything that would help solve the case, again, it falls back to the old adage that you want to collect it then not have it. And uh, I've gotten fingerprints off of beer cans, you know, that were stacked in the side. Uh, we can collect clothing. Sometimes they leave in such a hurry, they leave personal belongings. And all that stuff's taken and it's assist in the investigation. I'm real proud to be part of the team. It's uh, being prior military, it's great when you can see people come together and and usually it's something bad like this, but we all work together to do it safely in a, a timely fashion. We are the primary state agency that does fire investigations, and that's what I specialize in. Um, of course, given the volume of fires and the, the relatively small number of us, uh, there's me and eight others, we don't work every fire. But uh, the way we work it here in Fayetteville is uh, when the um, Engine 2 crew, when they get something either that they deem suspicious or it's a large scale, large loss, fatality fire, anything out of the ordinary, or if it's just something they might not have seen, then they'll call me in because I come in, I am a origin and call specialist. I come in as an extra set of eyes, extra set of experiences, and I also bridge the gap being a trained law enforcement officer. Uh, you know, I can do the fire scene part and then also kind of bridge over to the PD on the follow-up investigation side and, and work with both, because both, it, it is, and, and I'm sure it's already been mentioned, but a fire investigation is a team sport, is what we like to say. Uh, so we're just part of the team and, and we all work together. Uh, you've got to know, in order to properly work a fire scene, you've got to, you, you've got to understand fire behavior, fire dynamics, you've got to understand ignition sources, heat of ignition, uh, ventilation effects, there's so much science that goes into to being able to read a fire scene and analyze it and properly work it back to determine the origin and then the cause of the fire. But then you've got the whole law enforcement side of it also. 
uh, identifying leads, witnesses, all the, the legwork that goes into actually prosecuting. So it takes, it takes a lot of different skill sets in order, in, in order to, to bring a case to full fruition. Fire investigation over the last 15 to 20 years has really, really, of all the forensic sciences out there, we've really embraced the scientific method and, and try to be good fire scientists with what we do. Generally, uh, one of the uh, captains from the FIT team, the fire investigation team, uh, if they determine it's suspicious, they'll, they'll call us out. And um, they determine the cause of the fire and the origin and then we, they'll explain to us why they thought that. And then our job is basically to interview suspects or witnesses to see what we can come up with there to try and figure out who intentionally set the fire or accidentally set the fire. A while back, the SBI came out to most suspicious fires, but uh, their resources are stretched thin. And uh, so that's why they came up with the FIT team, so we would have local people that could um, come in and, and investigate the fires. The actual collection of physical evidence we leave to the forensic techs, but uh, we observe where it came from and what meaning it had to this particular fire and uh, interview witnesses or uh, people who might have had a motive um, and their friends and relatives and acquaintances. and. Uh, try and figure out who, who had their mindset uh, or a desire or motive to set the fire. If people out there are wa wanting to help or willing to help, uh, there's simple things they can do. The biggest thing, I guess, would be attention to detail. Uh, people fleeing the area or people standing and watching the fire. A lot of times a, an arsonist uh, likes to watch his work. So they might be just hanging around watching it uh, and then, of course, leave before the police get there. And paying attention to things like where they saw smoke coming from, what color the smoke was, because uh, that can tell us what was actually burning by the, the color of the smoke. Um, where the smoke was coming from, like from a window or from, a, uh, from the roof line or from a door, and just things like that, that just paying attention to detail. Unfortunately, I've worked several fatality fires where people have died with buckets or pots of water next to them. If your house catches on fire, get out. Um, that's my little spill for fire safety. Um, you know, let's, let's go ahead, call 911, get the guys with the big red trucks and the, and the big water hoses coming. Um, don't try to fight a fire on your own. You know, a small kitchen fire, yeah, you can pop it with a fire extinguisher. Okay, but if, if the fire extinguisher doesn't work, get out. Protect yourself first. Um, protect yourself and your family and don't go running back in. Um, that's one of the hardest things we have to deal with. Anytime you see any suspicious activity, um, the police department will tell you to go ahead and call 911. That's what we're here for. Um, that's our job. We're going to come out and investigate anything. We're here to make the citizens safe and that's, that's what our background is. So I mean, it's any suspicious activity, call 911.